Hello Internet, it's me Josh, the Agent Gamer. So, welcome to another Retro Review Omnibus. In this video right here, we're going to be taking a look back at Retro Reviews based on the amazing Spider-Man. Spider-Man is one of my favorite superheroes out there, and I've done a lot of reviews on Spider-Man. Uh, and there's a lot of Spider-Man reviews I want to do, but for now, here's my collection of good old webhead video games. In this video here, we'll be taking a look at Spider-Man games on the NES, the Sega Genesis, the Super Nintendo, and even the PlayStation 1. So, without further ado, here's the amazing Spider-Man! Hello Internet, it's me, Josh, the Aging Gamer. So, let's talk about Spider-Man. I've talked about this in past videos, but Spider-Man was one of my favorite superheroes as a kid. I followed that fantastic 90s cartoon. I still have a bunch of my Spider-Man action figures. I still have some of my old trading cards as well. And of course there were the old Spider-Man video games. And to be honest, this is where I got my Spider-Man fixes from. I didn't really read uh, Spider-Man comics, I was more of an X-Men kind of guy. Uh, so the first Spider-Man anything I've read was Maximum Carnage. And man, this story is dark. I mean, as a kid, this was one of the first things I was really exposed to that featured so much senseless murder and chaos. I mean, we see that a lot in TV shows now, but as a kid, it really hit me and I became fascinated with the story. Therefore, fascinated with the video game. I love the game, but <laughs> I was never really good at it. Well, I've had the opportunity to play it for the first time in many, many years, and I thought, why not review this thing? So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Spider-Man and Venom in Maximum Carnage. Maximum Carnage was released on the SNES and Sega Genesis back in 1994. A nice little touch that made this game even more appealing was the fact that the cartridge was solid red. Nice. So the first thing you'll see once you get past the title screen are cutscenes featuring panels ripped straight from the comics. See that? That's pretty damn awesome! The visuals are a really nice touch, and along with the music featured in the game, it really gives Maximum Carnage some personality. And since we're talking about cutscenes in the comics, let's go ahead and talk about the story here. To shorten it, Carnage breaks out of Ravencroft Asylum, supervillain Shriek tags along, and they eventually add Doppelganger, Demo Goblin, and Carrion. Spider-Man and Venom put aside their differences and team up to take on the villains. Other heroes like Black Cat, Cloak and Dagger, and even Captain America join in to fight off all those nasty evildoers. The video game does a great job explaining the story through dialogue and cutscenes, but what kind of game is this? Maximum Carnage is a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up. You start off playing as Spider-Man, and he does everything a Spider-Man can and should do in a game like this. You can punch, jump, jump kick, shoot web to trap enemies, shoot web to pull enemies closer to you, climb certain walls, swing around, and even use your web as a shield. And for the most part, the gameplay is pretty solid. It's actually a lot better than I originally remembered. The controls work well and there's surprisingly a lot of strategy here. Tie someone up in a web while you attack someone else, get perfectly in between two enemies and bash them together, or grapple one asshole just to throw at another. The only issue I had with the gameplay was when you get in a punch fest with an enemy, you'll automatically grapple them, which would leave you open to another attack from someone else. And considering how often you have to fight off hordes of enemies at once, this happened a lot. But other than that, the gameplay mechanics are responsive and fair. Also, having the ability to block is awesome, because that was something so many of the old side-scrolling beat-em-ups were missing. As you progress through the game, you'll reach several points where you can choose between playing as Spider-Man and playing as Venom. Being a big Venom fan, of course I'm going to play as him right away. Picking Venom will lead to a few different levels that you wouldn't see if you were playing as Spider-Man, so that's pretty cool. And for the most part, Venom plays exactly like Spider-Man does. You can do all the same moves and techniques with each character. The only real difference I could find between the two is that Venom seems a bit more powerful while Spider-Man's a bit quicker. The game also features a lot of cameos from other Marvel superheroes. 
You'll see a lot of the characters through cutscenes, but within the levels themselves you might find these little icons that let you summon a hero to help you out. You'll see the likes of Black Cat, Iron Fist, Firestar, and others. Sometimes summoning a hero will end with a different result depending on who you're playing as. For example, if you're playing as Spider-Man and you summon Black Cat, she'll do a bunch of flips on the screen. Though, if you're playing as Venom and summon her, she'll pounce on an enemy before flipping away. Now, as for the levels themselves, it loosely and accurately follows the comics, if that makes sense. A lot of the key boss fights, such as fighting Shriek and Doppelganger on the rooftop, fighting Carnage in the church, the fight at the nightclub, those are all taken right out of the comic. All the walking around and beating up random civilians? Of course that's filler for the video game. Expect typical 2D side-scrolling levels here. You know, beat up a bunch of enemies on one screen, follow the arrow to the next, beat up more enemies. There's really not much to say about it. Except for the fact that this game gets HARD! There's a lot of enemies to fight in each stage. A lot! They range from typical looking goatee douches, to trench coat thugs, to Dixie Kong ripoffs, high flying fat guys, and even bald umbrella poking creeps. You'll be fighting a lot of them at once, so you have to be on your toes and fight with some strategy. If you try to rush in and throw punches, you're going to get your ass kicked. Oh, and for those wondering why civilians are attacking Spider-Man and vice versa, in the comics it's explained that Carnage's mayhem on the city has brought out the chaotic side of humanity, and everyone starts to riot, so don't feel bad for beating on women and the elderly. Sometimes strategy isn't enough to win at this game, it's also a test of endurance. This game, this game will wear you down. Fighting off a bunch of civilians is one thing, but having to constantly fight off the main villain team? That's what's going to give you the game over screen. Shriek will shoot at you with her sonic blast. Hell, just getting too close to her can hurt you. Doppelganger can charge at you and stomp on your face. Demo Goblin will fly around and throw bombs at you. You can kick him off his glider, but he's even tougher fighting fist to fist. Carry on isn't too hard to fight off, but if he gets close, he'll actually drain your health. And of course, there's Carnage himself. His offense makes him hard to hit, and he even has long distance attacks. Overall, he's very hurty. There's so many times you have to fight these guys in this game, and it gets harder and harder with each encounter. They'll attack in twos, and when you defeat one, another villain will take its place. The best strategy here is to focus on one enemy, defeat them, then focus on another one. It's tough, but you can do it. If you're like me and you need all the help you can get, you're going to want to look for those secret rooms. They don't appear in all the levels, and some are pretty tricky to find, like the one where you can only access it if you let Carnage hit you into it. But once inside the secret room, you'll find extra health, lives, and continues that'll make the game a little easier to handle. There's also health and whatnot hidden throughout the levels, so keep your eyes peeled. Considering the challenge of the game, you'll want as much health and as much continues as possible. The main villains are tough, the massive amount of rioters are tough, the very cheap mini-boss Muzoid is tough, and beating Carnage once and for all is, of course, tough. So all in all, when it's all said and done, is Maximum Carnage a good or a bad game? It's terrible for all the right reasons. Not to sound like a broken record, but this game is really hard, like crazy hard. And I'm not saying that as a negative strike against the title, because the gameplay isn't broken or unfair. It's very much a test of the player's skills. Maximum Carnage isn't a game where you can expect to just jump in and beat it. You actually have to get good at it. And yeah, the game wore me down. The constant beatdowns and boss fights will exhaust you. But because of this, the further you get into the game, hell, if you manage to even beat it, it really gives off a sense of accomplishment. I can understand the difficulty turning people away from this title, hell, it did to me for years, but going back to it now, I can appreciate the title for its challenge. Perhaps the game could have benefited from having a difficulty setting or so, but the only real negative I have about this game is its lack of multiplayer. I mean, we got a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up starring both Spider-Man and Venom, but no two-player option? What the hell is that about? I suppose from the story's perspective, it wouldn't make sense, but damn, if my friends and I were able to tackle this game with two players instead of one back when we were kids, I'm sure we could have beat it. Though I suppose it's worth noting that the sequel to this game titled Separation Anxiety added two-player mode, but we'll save talking about that game for another day. Maximum Carnage definitely deserves that title. Maximum Carnage. And before I end my video, here's a little bit of trivia for you. The awesome music that plays on the title screen, that's done by the band Green Jelly, which you might have noticed their logo in the opening credits. I always assumed that was a game developer or something when I was a kid. 
but that title screen song is called Carnage Rules and is featured on their album 333 and actually features vocals. So now that I got another chance of playing Maximum Carnage, I think I'm done playing it for a very, very long time. It's not a bad game, it's just a challenge. But these are just my opinions. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. You like it? Hello Internet, it's me Josh, the Aging Gamer. So, as of November 12th, 2018, we lost one of, if not the greatest comic book legend of all time, Stan Lee. Along with other legends like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, he created an enormous amount of pop culture icons like the Amazing Spider-Man, the Astonishing X-Men, the Incredible Hulk, the Mighty Thor, the Invincible Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, and many, many, many more. My personal favorite is either Spider-Man or the X-Men, and if you've been following my channel for a while, that should come as no surprise since I've done so many reviews on games based on these characters. And today's no different. In honor of Stan Lee, I'm going to be reviewing Spider-Man. Not to be confused with Spider-Man, 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 or Spider-Man. After Spider-Man is framed for a crime he didn't commit by the seemingly turned good Dr. Octavius, Spider-Man has become the target of the NYPD. While Spider-Man is trying to figure out who framed him, Dr. Octopus is working on a plan to take over the city using symbiotes. Throw in a bunch of other villains like Rhino, Scorpion, Mysterio, Carnage, and Venom, as well as some cameos by Black Cat and numerous others, you got yourself an epic, action-packed Spider-Man adventure. And quite the adventure indeed. Now, this game had a lot to live up to, not just because of the Spider-Man name, but because this was Spider-Man's first transition into a 3D game. With going from technology from the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis to the likes of the PlayStation and the Dreamcast, there were pretty high standards. And for the most part, I think it did a pretty damn good job. Developed by Neversoft and published by Activision, the same duo who made the Tony Hawk Pro Skater games back when that meant something, you can really tell how much love they put into this game and there's just so much fan service to show from it. Just from the opening title screen you get to hear an awesome remix of the 60s Spider-Man theme song. You'll probably recognize a lot of the voice acting too as they used a lot of voice actors from the 90s Spider-Man animated series and Spider-Man Unlimited. Even Stan Lee himself narrates a few scenes. Welcome, true believers and newcomers alike. Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee here. Once again, we find our hero Peter Parker, better known around the world as the amazing Spider-Man in a heap of trouble. Throughout the game, you can also collect a lot of milestone comic covers from throughout Spider-Man's history. There's even a lot of costumes you can unlock for Spider-Man, again, from all throughout Spider-Man's rich history. So like I said, this game just oozes Spider-Man nostalgia for us to just eat up. But what kind of game is this? What kind of game is Spider-Man? Spider-Man is a third-person action-adventure. Spider-Man himself is very true to his comic book self here. You can go around and punch and kick bad guys, or you can tie them up with your webs. You also have the ability to easily climb walls and web swing from building to building. When enemies get close by, your Spider-Man sense will go off, and if you get lost or turned around, the good old Spidey compass will point you in the right direction. As you can see, up to the point of this game's release, this is the most Spider-Man Spider-Man has ever been in a game. If you happen to lose health or run low on webbing, keep your eyes open for health icons and web cartridges. Also keep your eyes open for that cool silver Spider-Man armor. If you find it within one of the levels, you'll become invincible before the suit eventually gets destroyed. Now when we get to the levels themselves, they usually consist of just making your way to the end of the stage. And while for some games that sounds pretty boring, but in this game it's not bad at all. The story, the voice acting, the level structures, it's all done in a way where it's just entertaining. The game is fast paced and you aren't really 
really forced to stay in any area too long. Sometimes you'll have some objectives to complete first, such as rescuing hostages or making sure you defeat all the enemies. There's also a few levels that have you chasing someone or being chased yourself. The gameplay is mixed up enough and fast paced so the game never drags and you never feel bored. So you're just constantly on the move. With that said, you should take your time and explore all the stages and make sure you get all the collectible comics and to check out a lot of the easter eggs. Throughout this game you'll have a few boss fights. You'll fight with the likes of Scorpion, Rhino, Venom, Mysterio, Dr. Octopus, Carnage, and even Carnage Dr. Octopus. Good god was this frightening when I was little. <laughs> All these battles are completely different from each other and there's usually some pattern to defeat the villains. I loved fighting Mysterio, climbing up the different levels and slowly beating him up was pretty cool. The fights with Venom are unique to say the least. For some reason he has the ability to teleport. What? And instead of attacking Spider-Man, he just kisses him. <laughs> ah, get a bread, man! So yeah, a lot of this game holds up really well. The presentation is just phenomenal. The way the levels are designed, the voice acting, the level structures, the objectives, uh, the music, everything is just fantastic. It's aged very well, except for a few things. From my experience, the biggest annoyance about this game is a problem that most games typically had when they were first going from 2D to 3D environments, and that's the camera angles. There's no free camera control, there's no manual screen adjusting or anything like that. The camera will face whichever direction Spider-Man is facing. Sounds ideal, but man, it gets in the way. Objects will obstruct your vision, hell, buildings will get in your way. It's just not great. I also want to talk about the visuals. While the blocky look doesn't bother me, some of those faces are ugly. Mary Jane in particular is just horrifying. And I don't understand why, but Black Cat only wears a mask in the Dreamcast version. Speaking of different versions, if you are going to play this game, the Dreamcast version is the way to go. It's visually the best one, adding small details like Black Cat's mask or the lines in Spider-Man's suit. If you can't get the Dreamcast version, the PlayStation version, which I'm using for this review, is still pretty great and you'll get mostly the same experience you would on the Dreamcast. The Nintendo 64 version, on the other hand, make this your last resort. Not only were a lot of the sound bites taken out, but all of the cutscenes. Instead, they're replaced with comic-style text. Yeesh. So to wrap this all up, the game does have its faults, but it's mostly due to the limitations of its time. The game still holds up pretty well, and I had a blast playing it again. I gotta admit though, it is a little on the short side. If you're just going straight from beginning of the level to the end without trying to collect all the secrets and all that, it's, it's not gonna last you very long. But there is plenty of replay value here. There's costumes you'll collect for doing certain tasks, there's comic books to collect, there's different difficulty modes to try, there's even a what if mode. It's essentially the same regular playthrough, but it throws in a bunch of extra dialogue, cameos, and even more easter eggs. That's nuts. Spider-Man, is it worth getting? Absolutely. I, I think it's fantastic. I haven't played every single Spider-Man game out there, but this one is easily one of the best. But you know what? That's just my opinion. What do you guys think about the game? So I think I've mentioned it, oh, a few dozen times that Spider-Man is one of my favorite superheroes. He is just so badass. And my favorite version of Spider-Man is usually the video game versions because they just focus on him taking names and kicking ass. Like for example, one of Spider-Man's earliest games, Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin for the Sega Genesis, this Spider-Man is ruthless. <laughs> Released in 1991, this was an early Genesis favorite. While some parts of it hasn't aged too greatly, it actually had a lot of interesting ideas. But first, let's talk about the story. A nameless, concerned citizen has alerted the city of New York that Spider-Man has placed a bomb in the city that will blow it up in 24 hours. He offers $10,000 for anyone that will stop him. Yeah, nothing suspicious about this at all. So Spider-Man, wanting to hunt down the Kingpin, hears rumors of Dr. Octopus's whereabouts and decides to beat some info out of him. This leads to a whole string of events that leads to Spider-Man hunting down his rogues gallery to obtain keys that will shut down the bomb. This involves getting into fights with Dr. Octopus, Electro, Hobgoblin, Sandman, Venom, the Lizard, and of course, Kingpin himself. 
Throughout the game, Spider-Man will do a lot of Spider-Man-like stuff, like shooting webs, web-slinging, climbing on walls and ceilings, and punching and kicking bad guys until they black out. And let's talk a bit about the bad guys here. You'll see the typical gun-shooting thugs, which a lot of the time is really freaking annoying. You'll also see Spider-Man kick rats in the face and step on snakes. There's also some mid-level bosses like the forklift driver and the biker chick and a gorilla that escaped from the zoo. <laughs> yeah, it's actually kind of weird. So, some of the levels in this game have a linear path for you to follow, like the warehouse and the underground lab, but some levels, like the sewers or the park, you can kind of just web-sling your way to the end. It's kind of broken in that way. In fact, I found myself using glitches a lot in the game. I'm literally standing next to Dr. Octopus as I just keep punching him to defeat him. Defeating the gorilla and Venom is as easy as tricking them into getting their face kicked. This game does have its difficult parts though, so there's two things that really makes this game stand out compared to other early Spider-Man titles. One is the fact that you're actually timed. You have 24 hours to stop the bomb. Well, not exactly 24 hours, as each minute is actually 11 seconds, so it's more like you got around four and a half hours to beat the game. That sounds like a long time to beat the game, but here's the thing. Chances are you're gonna get pretty beat up while playing. Yeah, you'll find health resource throughout levels, but you don't find them that often, and when you do, they don't restore that much health, and also your health doesn't regenerate between levels. So at any point in the game, you can return to your apartment and your health will slowly restore. As it restores though, time drains pretty quick. It's an interesting mechanic that's gonna make you a little cautious while playing. Speaking of which, the other interesting gimmick here is that you can take pictures. That's right, you can use little Peter Parker's photography skills to take pictures at any point. You can take pictures of crooks and bad guys, but you make the most money from taking pictures of bosses. What's the point of all this? Well, the more money you earn from pitchers, the more you'll be able to refill your web fluid. Similar to health restores, you'll find web fluid during levels, but not nearly enough to be fully stored at any point, because you're likely to use a lot of webs during the stages. Both the photography and timer really gives this game a bit of an identity. It's kind of cool and makes you strategize your play style a bit more. When it's all said and done though, uh, Spider-Man and the King Bin isn't the most memorable game. The actual gameplay mechanics aren't anything special, and it's something we would only see improved on in later games. All the boss fights in this game feel a bit broken too. Kingpin in particular has an odd hitbox and hitting him almost seems to be luck based. At the point in time where this was the newest Spider-Man game on the market, it was pretty amazing. But in this day and age, and even in comparison to other Spider-Man games of that era, it's nothing special. It's not a bad game though. If you're a big Marvel or Spider-Man fan and want to check out some retro games, sure, this could be amusing. But if you don't check it out, eh, you're not really missing out on much. Hello Internet, it's me Josh, the Aging Gamer. So, let's go ahead and talk about superheroes. Growing up, my favorite were the Uncanny X-Men and the Amazing Spider-Man. But being a kid of the 90s, why wouldn't they be? Spider-Man had an awesome cartoon series as well as a pretty cool toy line. I'll also never forget how amazing that Spider-Man serial was too. X-Men on the other hand had a freaking amazing and very mature animated series that is in my opinion the best Marvel animated series to date. X-Men had their fair share of awesome toys and trading cards as well, and of course there was all the video games featuring both of these series. So how mind-blowing is it to think that there was an actual video game crossover between Spider-Man and the X-Men? Well, is it any good? Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge. Good God, that theme is just so damn epic, I love it! <laughs> so, Spider-Man and the X-Men is loosely based off the Uncanny X-Men issues 123 through 125. 
The box art is also pretty interesting as the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis have completely different artwork despite being the same exact game. Even the costumes for the X-Men are all over the place. I mean, the box art, back of the box, and advertisements can't even fully agree with the in-game costumes. And also completely random, but at the end of the game in the Super Nintendo version, Cyclops has a full mask, whereas in the Genesis version, he has his hair out. That's weird. Anyway, let's get to the story of the game. The game opens with a cutscene of Spider-Man swinging around the city and seeing fellow X-Men being captured by the evil genius, Arcade. This brings us to the first level of the game where we play as Spider-Man. Our goal is to disarm some bombs. Each bomb has to be disarmed in a certain order, which sounds tedious, but thanks to Spider-Man's spider sense, you'll know where to go. Since we're playing as Spider-Man, here's what he can do. There's a button for shooting webs that lets you attack enemies from a distance, there's a button for jumping, and there's a button that shoots at a grapple web. You can also climb on certain kinds of walls. Once you disarm all the bombs and reach the end of the level, you'll have another cutscene. Arcade has captured all the X-Men. Well, in this case, four of them. Wolverine, Cyclops, Storm, and Gambit. So Arcade welcomes you to Murder World. To escape, each X-Men, as well as Spider-Man, will have to go through their own separate levels, fighting evil supervillains along the way. So each hero has two of their own levels that they have to go through, and it's not going to be easy. Trust me. Let's go ahead and start with Wolverine. So Wolverine is in a funhouse themed level filled with evil clowns, trigger happy jack in the boxes, and buzz saws coming out of the freaking ground. Delightful. So Wolverine's controls are pretty simple. He jumps, punches, and uppercuts. You can also pop out your claws to do more damage with your attacks. The downside of using your claws though is that your healing factor won't work, so use those claws sparingly. Your goal is to jump from platform to platform, scaling the level until you reach the boss. And can we take a moment to appreciate the frightening details in the background? I mean, look at this odd chattering teeth creature. And if you don't like clowns, well, you're not going to enjoy seeing this evil looking son of a bitch everywhere. Trivia time, that clown is actually a reference to Marvel's own Obnox show, The Clown. Anyway, use your clawed uppercuts to tear up the walls. If you're running low on life, beat up those jack-in-the-box enemies without your claws to receive some health. Once you get to the end of the level, you'll face none other than Apocalypse, one of the greatest, most powerful X-Men villains. Just hanging out in a funhouse. A bit weird, but whatever, all the villains in this game are androids created by Arcade anyway. So, to do damage to Apocalypse, you can only hurt him while he's in midair. Slice at him quite a bit and he'll eventually explode. Kablooey! Now we're moving on to Wolverine's second level. <laughs> Not gonna lie, this level took me days to figure out. When you start the level, you'll notice that you're being chased by the Juggernaut, bitch. It seems that you're supposed to run away from him, cutting down anvils and weights to slow him down while you escape. However, the faster you run, the faster he runs. If you make it to the end of the level, congrats, you're dead. So the goal of the level is that you must destroy him. How? Well, start by slicing the shit out of him with your claws. This bastard is going to take a lot of hits to kill. Now here's something I didn't know about when first playing through this level. While you definitely want to cut down all the obstacles to hurt Juggernaut, they actually do a hell of a lot more damage than normal if you drop the items on top of him rather than in front of him. So yeah, drop items on him and keep shanking him and he'll eventually explode. Yeah! Now let's move on to Cyclops' level. His stage takes place in the underground mines of Genosha. Cyclops has the ability to jump, shoot from his visor, and can perform a swift kick that just looks ridiculous. So before we get too into Cyclops' levels, I just want to point out that there's something in almost every single level, some kind of gimmick, some kind of setup, that just makes you think, wow, this game was developed by a real dick! With Cyclops' levels, there's minecarts you have to ride in. If you miss jumping into a cart, you get electrocuted and die. There's also a lot of blind jumps, so expect a lot of trial and error. You'll be fighting off soldiers, these stupid hovering robots that chase you around, and what I'm assuming are Mole Man's subterranean followers. Watch out for these guys as Cyclops' optic blast won't hurt them. Also, they throw their poop. I'm assuming. Once you get to the end of the level, you'll come face to face with a sentinel. He shoots two different kinds of lasers and jumps around the screen. Just keep hitting him with your optic blast and you'll be good. Then we exit the stage. Now Cyclops' second level is more or less the same, just a slightly different background. Towards the end of the level, you'll fight another sentinel and a crowd of bad guys. Pass by them and now you'll fight a real boss, Master Mold. 
Now in this fight, you gotta shoot him a lot. There's no real strategy other than dodge and shoot optic blast. First his arm will blow off, then his head, then eventually the rest. Kablooey. We'll now get into Gambit's levels. As a kid, I could never survive longer than 30 seconds on this level, but hey, that was probably because I was suffering from the anxiety of a giant spike ball chasing me. In this level, you want to keep moving forward. Gambit himself doesn't do much, just jumps and shoots cards. Be careful to not throw too many cards because you can run out. Luckily, most enemies will give you cards back if you kill them. So yeah, try to kill everything in your way, avoid hazards, and keep your card ammo full. Once you reach the end of the stage, you'll go against a boss, a giant playing card. I think that's supposed to be a reference to Hellfire Club's Sebastian Shaw. I couldn't find anything to confirm this, but the next level also features a member of the Hellfire Club, and one of Sebastian Shaw's aliases is the Black King. So I'm just putting two and two together. So this giant card will shoot lasers at you, just like everything else in this goddamn game, and will spawn enemies. That's actually a good thing, as killing these robots will give you a chance to refill your card meter. Once the card turns red, it becomes invincible. Wait for it to turn into its original color and spam those cards. Once it's hit enough, it will be defeated. Now we move on to Gambit's second level. This level's gimmick is that you'll be on a platform that will always be moving up, so try not to get squished. Once you reach the end, you'll fight against a giant version of Hellfire Club's The Black Queen. Stick to one side of the screen and watch out for, of course, lasers and fireballs. Start spamming those cards and you'll eventually blow off her arms. Jesus Christ. Throw some more cards and you'll eventually blow off her head too. Now she's defeated. Now let's move on to the last X-Men, Storm. Of course, her levels are gimmicky as well. Both of her levels have her in some kind of underwater maze. The downside is that you only have so much air until you suffocate. The upside is that your air also acts as your health, so if you get beat up, you can always go up for air to regenerate. I feel Storm's levels are a bit easier in comparison to other X-Men's as long as you take your time. So using Storm's lightning bolts, you must blow up these tanks here that will make the water rise. The tanks aren't quite puzzles, but you should definitely check your surroundings and use strategy when blowing them up. Through the stage, you'll also be attacked by piranhas, laser shooting squids, and scuba steves. Like I mentioned before, too many hits or if you suffocate, you die. Hear that scream? That's the sound of a beloved X-Men screaming her final breath before she becomes a bloated, rotting corpse. It's pretty brutal, huh? Once you get to the end of the stage, there will be a spinning looking device that will shoot at you. Best strategy I can think of is just swim down to the bottom of the screen where it can't hit you and just start blasting it. Exit the stage and we move on to Storm's level 2. This level is pretty much the same as the first, except for at the end of this one, we don't get some awesome boss fight. Instead, we get these glass capsules that shoot at you. Shoot back at all 10 capsules and Storm's levels are now done. Now we move back to old Webhead. We're in a construction zone of some sort and there's robots everywhere. Blast everything with your web shooters. You're also going to have to learn to master the web grappling swing in this level because there's a lot of tight areas you're going to have to go through. Experiment pressing up or down while grappling to reach certain distances. About halfway through the level you'll find the Shocker. He'll jump around and shoot at you. Best strategy is to get on the same platform as him, dodge his blast, then duck and shoot web shots until he's defeated. Once he explodes, you'll get more life. Sweet. Continue your way through the level and you'll eventually fight Shocker yet again. Then you'll fight the stage's boss, Metroid's Ridley. Oh, well, maybe that's not Ridley. That's actually... Naster? Naster? I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but he's just some D-level magic demon character from the comics. What an odd choice for an in-game villain. Just keep shooting at him. When he gets hit, he drops diamonds. Because reasons. And when Spider-Man picks up the diamonds, his health regenerates. Also because reasons. Blast him enough and he's defeated. Now, moving on to Spider-Man's second stage, we're just swinging around rooftops. Nothing notable about the stage here other than a few weather effects that will blow Spider-Man around if you're not careful. Reach the end of the stage and you'll fight not one, but two bosses at the same time, Rhino and Carnage. Rhino runs back and forth, running into walls. When he hits a wall, Spider-Man will drop to the bottom of the stage, unless you are already in mid-air. So try to time your jumps. Since Rhino doesn't target you like Carnage does, let's go after Carnage first. 
Carnage jumps around and throws Symbioku at you. Chase him while also keeping your distance. Once you hit him enough, Carnage gets butt naked and disappears. Now we just got Rhino. To hurt him, you have to do grapple swings and hit him from behind. After enough times, he explodes! Yay! You will not play very short little levels as each X-Men. You'll just jump platform to platform fighting the same bad guys from each X-Men stages. An interesting thing to note is that this is the only time you get to do a platform level as Storm. She can shoot lightning bolts in almost any direction. But what's up with that jump? Does she really have to spread her legs so far to do that? It looks ridiculous! Last, you'll do a short Spider-Man level where he descends down through the level until you reach the final boss room. You'll see the X-Men captured in a giant arcade robot. I know I've said it throughout the whole review, but the only real strategy is to dodge and shoot. Once Arcade's creepy-ass tank is destroyed, it will turn into a bouncy little machine. Once that's destroyed, it will turn into a tiny but quicker version of the tank. And once that's destroyed, multiple arcades will start popping out. Stay close to the walls and the recaptured X-Men will actually help you out. Once you destroy all the arcade robots, congrats, you beat the game. You get a cutscene showing everyone escaping, all to some classy sounding music. I almost expect Frank Sinatra to start singing at any moment. And that's Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge. So, let's talk about this game a little bit more. Let's see, should I start with the good or the bad? Let's look at what this game does wrong first. Arcade's Revenge is the very definition of trial and error gameplay. Taking a look at Wolverine's Juggernaut stage is a pretty good example. Since the game came out in 1992, you're just plopped into a level with no explanation. Juggernaut takes so many hits, you think you're not even supposed to fight him, that you're supposed to run away, only to find out if you make it to the end of the level, you're screwed. After finding out you do have to kill him, there's got to be a certain way to do even that. And going back to Cyclops' level? It's just too easy to die. There's a part where a whole platform just straight up crushes you without any clue that it was going to drop. Also, everything in this game explodes, damaging you in the process. All of this just makes the game a little unfair. Yeah, the game is a lot easier once you know all the tips and tricks, like some of the stuff I've been giving throughout the review, but it's still a difficult game. I think this game could have really benefited from some simple additions, like checkpoints to all the levels, or not having so many enemies damage you as you kill them. Or how about giving the player some goddamn continues? When you lose, get a game over, you start from the very beginning again. As for the good things in this game, well, <laughs> the soundtrack is pretty good. Seriously, this soundtrack rocks. Each track just fits each level so well, especially Spider-Man's. It just sounds so Spider-Man-like, like early post-Steve Ditko era, if that makes sense. Gambit's and Cyclops' themes just really get you pumped up too. I also love how much of the Marvel Universe is crammed into this game. There's a lot of characters and a lot of references here, even if some are more obscure like Obnoxio and this guy. I also appreciate how each character plays pretty true to themselves without being overly complicated. I mean, this is an old game so the controls have to be simple, but Spider-Man does everything Spider-Man should do. He shoots webs, climbs walls, and swings around. Wolverine regenerates health and can tear down walls with his claws. Each character feels pretty true to themselves, and that's something I appreciate. But, is the game any good? Not really, and it breaks my heart to say that because I want to love this game so much. I love the characters, I love the music, and I love the systems it was released on, but I just don't find myself having as much fun as I hope while playing. I mentioned how difficult the game is, and I'm not saying the game is bad because it's hard, because I actually like games that are a bit more challenging. It's bad because the levels have too many cheap ways to die, and not enough extra lives to make up for it. There's games like Ninja Gaiden and Castlevania that have a lot of cheap deaths as well, but at least there was continues to make up for it. You can learn the levels and better yourself. Arcade's Revenge just doesn't offer players a chance to actually enjoy the game, as the gameplay experience is cut too short. Again, I wanted to love this game, but I can't. But those are just my opinions. What do you guys think? What do you think of Spider-Man and the X-Men? Hello Internet, it's me Josh, the Aging Gamer. So, Spider-Man. I've done quite a few reviews on the Web Slinger already, and well, I have another one for you guys. This time we're going to be taking a look at the game Venom and Spider-Man Separation Anxiety. 
So in September of 1994, we saw the release of Maximum Carnage. Love it or hate it, the game was pretty dang popular and was a success. Game publisher Acclaim Entertainment wanted to do a sequel. Developer Software Creations was put on the job again and decided to do a follow-up based on the Venom story arc, Separation Anxiety. Well, at least by name. It actually follows more of the Venom Lethal Protector story, but regardless, we got ourselves a sequel. And in November of 1995, we saw Separation Anxiety, released on the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and PC. I didn't have the game as a kid. I saw it advertised in magazines and comic ads, but at that point in time, I felt Carnage's popularity had already peaked, and I wasn't that interested in what these symbiote spawns were all about. They were just a knockoff of Carnage. Who was already a knockoff of Venom? Who's a knockoff of Spider-Man? But anyway, how does this game hold up? Is it a justifiable sequel, or is it just a cash grab? Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Venom and Spider-Man Separation Anxiety. So when the game starts, we get a wall of text telling the story. The mysterious science organization, the Life Foundation, captured Venom and removed five spawns from the symbiote. These spawns now want to kill Venom. Venom contacts Spider-Man for help, and the two are going to put a stop to the spawns and the Life Foundation. So, let's play! And something really cool about this game is that it's two players. Maximum Carnage was only one player and could have really used that feature. So, yeah, thank God it's in this game. <laughs> but... Like usual, I'm gonna go ahead and play one player mode. And you get to pick between Spider-Man and Venom. They play the same and do the same kind of moves. The only difference I could really tell is that Venom seems a bit stronger, while Spider-Man seems a bit faster. One thing right off the bat I want to talk about though is, man, what happened to the stylization that was in Maximum Carnage? Maximum Carnage had awesome cutscenes ripped straight from the comic book. It also had a cool intro screen that even showed off the characters. Here? There's no cutscenes at all, just walls of text in the same picture as Spider-Man and Venom at the beginning of each level. That's pretty lame, really. I'm, I'm kind of let down. Well, let's continue and see what the game does have to offer. We start the first stage, and wait, this looks just like Maximum Carnage. Like, exactly like Maximum Carnage. We got the same backgrounds and the same enemies, but somehow the graphics seem not as good. In fact, both Spider-Man and Venom have new sprites. And look at some of these poses. Venom's are alright, but Spider-Man's really cracks me up. He reminds me of a five-year-old trying to do a Spider-Man impression. Hey son, how does Spider-Man jump? Like this and like this! Great! Now can Spider-Man climb walls? Yes, and when he's on the wall he attacks like this! D sure, good job! And how does Spider-Man walk? Like this! Rawr. Well, outside of the graphics, the gameplay feels mostly the same as before. You'll punch and kick and web sling and shield and tie up enemies just like before. Start beating up a lot of enemies and you'll see your health bar flash red. Your next strike will now be a super strike that KOs standard enemies. As we play this all too familiar stage, we'll eventually reach the end where we fight our first boss, the Digger. This boss is actually one of the easiest bosses out there. Pin him against a wall and he'll be defeated pretty easily. So that was the first stage of the game, and to me it feels really out of place. It's basically a maximum carnage stage. After this though, we never see those enemies ever again, minus the digger. It, it's a whole new game from here on out. Now we're on the Golden Gate Bridge and we meet our new standard enemy, the Life Foundation Soldiers. These lovely grunts come in a variety of colors and some have different attacks, like throwing bombs or shooting lasers. I hope you like them because this is what you'll be fighting for the majority of the game. Yeesh. So the bridge is a typical beat em up stage with a boss at the end. His name is Ramshot. Yeah, this game has a lot of taser face quality of names here. He's easy enough to beat up and we move on. We enter a forest that has a few not so secret areas we can go to. We even find superhero icons. Similar to the last game, when you collect these you can summon a hero in the battle to help you out. There's only four in the game, but you can get help from Captain America, Daredevil, Hawkeye, and Ghost Rider. Once you reach the end we'll fight our first symbiote spawn, Riot. Despite how threatening he was in the Venom movie, he's not too bad here. He's kind of annoying, but we can beat him. 
After this, we get swooped up and captured by Sentry. Not to be confused with the other Marvel character Sentry, this Sentry, like Ramshot and a few other bosses later in this game, are from a group that call themselves The Jury and are set on capturing Spider-Man and Venom. The next stage is called Trap Room. Sentry captured you and locked you up. Your character easily breaks free and continues to beat up everyone in sight. You get caught by Sentry and put in that trap room not once, not twice, but five times throughout the game. That's ridiculous! I know getting captured and taken to the prison is just another way for the game to continue its story, but it's just lazy writing, and it just makes the game feel really repetitive. Anyway, beat up the goons as well as some robots, and we'll move on to the elevator stage where we fight the next jury member, Bomb Blast. After that, we reach a city cave, and at the end, we fight the symbiote spawn, Scream. Once defeated, we get captured again, and we're back in the trap room. After this, we're in a shopping mall for some reason. We're fighting more and more soldiers as we make our way to the end. We have a boss fight against both Ramshot and Bomb Blast. Once we defeat them, we get into a sewer maze. I'm not sure if it's an actual maze though. There's different paths you can take, but I just kind of kept going forward and I got to fight some bosses, so yeah, it's, it's not that hard at all. We get another double boss fight, but this time it's between Scream and Riot. Defeat them and we're back in the trap room, yay! We continue in a lab area where we beat up more enemies and run into Ramshot again. Oh, oh wait, this is a new jury member. His name is Screech. I think of two things when I hear that name, Saved by the Bell and the other character in this game called Scream. We got characters named Scream and Screech in this game, yet somehow the characters have nothing to do with each other other than the fact that they want to get Venom and Spider-Man. It's odd. As we continue, we're in another lab area where the foreground blocks a lot of the action. The boss at the end of this stage is the symbiote spawn, Phage. You don't really need any kind of strategy to beat this boss other than keep your space and attack when necessary, which is what you should be doing throughout the game anyway. Once we beat him, we get captured again by Sentry, fight some robots, and the next stage we're in a greenhouse area where we'll eventually have a boss fight with the other female symbiote spawn, Agony. Beat her up and we'll move on further and further into this never-ending life foundation fortress. In this warehouse looking area, we'll fight with Bomb Blast and we get to fight Sentry. Good, I'm tired of this guy freaking capturing me. If I freaking kill this guy, he can't do shit to me anymore. Well, guess what? I kick his ass and he still captures me. Jesus, dude, I'm over this stupid trap room level. Ugh! When we get through this, we enter another lab area, except this time everything is red. We have a fight with the last of the five symbiote spawns, Lasher. Let's kick his ass. Yes. So after he's defeated, guess what? We get to fight all five spawns and the whole jury crew. One after another after another. Defeat them all and the game still isn't over. We now have to fight the final boss of the game, Carnage. He'll run and slice at you, but pace yourself and he can be defeated. And once he is, the game is complete. And yeah, this is all you get for your efforts. A single screen that says game complete. You don't get a wall of text explaining what happens afterwards or anything. It just ends. That's so lame. So that's Venom and Spider-Man and Separation Anxiety. So is it a yay or is it a nay? Well, despite having a few improvements over Maximum Carnage, it's a nay. So like I said, there are some improvements. The game has multiplayer, which is a big plus if you got someone else to play with. It's also got a password system, which is appreciated since if you lose all your lives, it's game over. There's also a few passwords that'll give you extra power attacks, stage select, and infinite lives. And all in all, I have to say this game is more forgiving than Maximum Carnage. Maximum Carnage was brutal in the difficulty and was a real test of endurance. They hardly had any health items and there was no passwords in that game. Separation Anxiety, on the other hand, is very forgiving. There's a lot more health items and extra lives you can collect. The game still has its share of difficulty, but the game definitely throws you a bone here and there. And while that's all fine and dandy, just about everything else in Separation Anxiety is not so great. Visually, while not necessarily bad, it's not that great either. The graphics seem dumbed down from the last game. The levels themselves are boring looking too. And like I mentioned before, there's no awesome cutscenes returning here. Just some text and some pictures of our heroes and occasionally Century. This game feels way too repetitive. From the second stage to the last stage, it plays the same. It's just a boatload of Life Foundation soldiers and maybe a couple of robots every time. 
I was honestly just getting bored playing this game. It doesn't help that you have to play the trap room a bunch of times, but every level is just the same nonsense with a different background. It's awful. And to top it off, the music is annoying too. It feels like there's only three tracks in the whole game. Again, this makes it feel very repetitive. And you know what, since I'm throwing it all out there, why did they even choose this story to base a game around? Besides Spider-Man, Venom, and Carnage, who even cares about these characters? I mean, they're just a bunch of lame C-listers. Does anyone really care about the likes of Riot or Lasher? Did anyone cream their pants over seeing Bomb Blast or Screech in this game? No. But all in all, Separation Anxiety is not a broken game, it's just... not very fun. It's like the game took all the things that made Maximum Carnage great and threw it out the window. And you're just left with a boring beat-em-up with a Spider-Man skin on it. It just feels like a low-effort cash grab. But these are just my opinions. What do you guys think? What do you think of Venom and Spider-Man Separation Anxiety? Love the game. Hello Internet, it's me Josh, the Aging Gamer. So, Spider-Man No Way Home is about to come out. How crazy is it to think that three separate movie universes about the same character are about to combine into one? That, that's amazing, spectacular, sensational even. Spider-Man is one of my favorite superheroes, and it's pretty cool to think that there's been so many Spider-Man movies in the past two decades. Everyone can argue which version of Spider-Man is their favorite, but as for myself, I mostly enjoyed just seeing how they all adapt new villains to cinema form. Throughout the Spider-Man films, we've seen the likes of Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, Sandman, Electro, The Lizard, Vulture, Shocker, Mysterio, Rhino, Venom, Carnage, and to a very far extent, Kingpin. And we'll see a handful of these characters return in this new movie too. And to think, there's still a bunch of other Spider-Man villains who have yet to make their movie debuts. Similar to Batman and his rogues gallery, I've always liked the dynamic between Spider-Man and his villains. And now with this new and possibly biggest Spider-Man movie ever coming out, I thought it'd be fun to take a look back at an old Spider-Man game. With the love of Spider-Man, his villains, and nostalgic video games, why don't we take a look back at a video game that features Spider-Man's deadliest foes coming together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six is loosely based off Amazing Spider-Man issues 334 through 339 from the story with the same name. So, Dr. Octopus has reunited the Sinister Six and is planning on taking over the world. Now as a big strong team, what better way to stop Spider-Man than to fight him one-on-one? -on -one? Huh. Well, our first stage is against Electro. Uh, oh god, these graphics. Ugh. So, to control Spider-Man, use the D-pad. Press B to jump, press A to punch, and double tap A to jump kick. You can shoot out a web to swing on by jumping and pressing A, but it doesn't seem too reliable or necessary. Let's start playing by beating up this harmless tweaker. Whoa, holy shit! One kick from Spider-Man and he blew up! That's awesome! So this is your life bar in the corner. I think it's supposed to be four hit bars, but when you get hit, you don't necessarily lose health. It seems like different enemy attacks cause different amounts of damage, and so health depletes differently depending on that attack. Sounds a bit confusing, but that's because I'm confused by it. Regardless, it's not very good at telling you exactly how much life you got. If you find one of these in a level, pick it up, and now you can shoot webs up to 10 times. A helpful hint about enemies is that if you kill a few of them, they'll slowly refill your life. You'll want to defeat as many as you can too since that's the only way to get more health. Seriously, there's no health pickups and you don't even recover between stages. That's a load of shit! Who made this game? Hey, Bit Studios! Fuck you! Anyway, back to the level. It's pretty straightforward. Move ahead while fighting off enemies and jumping over these dastardly placed fences. The second part of the stage has us in a power station, which again is pretty straightforward. Beat this guy up in front of the locked door to get the key to unlock that locked door. What a dilemma. Now let's fight Electro. Turn off the machine to upset him and he'll start flying around the stage. He's so pissed off he can't even fly straight. He'll fly wherever he wants and he'll shoot lightning bolts, wait until there's an opportunity and then start mashing that A button. Let's send this fool back to jail. 
or or not. Was it just Batman that had that no-killing rule? Because that was straight up murder. Sandman appears with a fist of fury. No one fists Spider-Man. Let's hunt him down in this toxic waste dump. There's bad guys and rats everywhere. There's also one of the most common hazards you'll see in early 8-bit and 16-bit video games. Drips! Oh god, these leaks are dangerous! Run, Spider-Man! This level isn't exactly a maze, but if you're not paying attention, you'll miss a dynamite and detonator that you'll need to continue. Don't! Now let's fight Sandman. This asshole appears right where you're standing. Just step aside and start punching him in the sandbags to win. Man, that's some Mortal Kombat shit right there. Now it's time to fight Mysterio. We're in the house of illusion. Feathers turn into bombs and these butterflies turn into frickin' missiles. This stage is actually pretty challenging. There's lots of enemies and hazards throughout this whole thing. There's also these weird monster dudes that'll slice you up. If you go slightly out of your way, you'll find some of these night goggles that'll help you get through this section. One of the hardest parts in this level is trying to get to that boss door without being torn to shreds by these guys. Well, uh, go for it, Spidey! Yeah, I made it! And there's Mysterio! Hiya! 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 I killed him! Let's go and. Oh, it's one of those kill the fake ones until you find the real one type deal. Well, good thing none of them are too hard. And Spider-Man must have a soft spot for Mysterio because he doesn't blow him up into a million pieces when he defeats him. Now let's get Vulture. Spider-Man? What, what are you even doing exactly? So this level can be tough too. Probably the toughest in the game. Vulture keeps swooping in and he'll throw bombs down at you. There's already bombs that fall down too, so it's really dangerous. Tiptoe your way towards the end and we'll have a rooftop battle with Vulture. He'll keep swooping by, but he'll occasionally land a fight. Just punch him little by little and you'll eventually blow him up too. Ha 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 ha! Oh man, I guess we're fighting this fool next. Enter the forest. We'll fight bats as well as... What the hell is that thing? The game manual says it's a club throwing troll? A troll? Doesn't that seem kind of out of place? Like, yeah, I know we got superhuman shooting electricity, turning into sand, and, and the boss is a pumpkin throwing goblin, but, but a troll? That doesn't really fit in the game to me. Occasionally throughout the stage, Hobgoblin will appear and attack, but if you're subtle enough, you can catch him, staring off into the distance, pondering all his life decisions as well as his own existence. Why does he do what he does? Does killing really make him happy? Is he angry or just out of touch with reality? Does- OH SHIT! At the end, we get a real showdown with him. He'll shoot lasers from his glider if you're beneath him, and he'll throw pumpkin bombs at you if you're above him. Scattered throughout this battle area are a few web shooter power-ups, so grab those, keep on moving, and shoot him when the chance is there. He'll explode and we'll move on to the final level with Dr. Octopus. Okay, so this might be the hardest level, and I recommend just avoiding as many enemies as you can, because minus the bosses we already fought, we're fighting every bad guy we've fought in this game so far. Make it to the end though, and it's time for that big showdown. This right here is going to be the easiest boss fight in the entire game. Just run up and start wailing on the guy. Take that, nerd! After you do that to him three times, you win! That's it! No credits, no point scoreboard, not that it matters, and we just go back to the title screen. So that's it, that's Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six. So, how is it? Quite frankly, it's crap. It's a real crappy game. First, let's talk about the presentation of it all. The level art is pretty cool, but the actual graphics are awful, especially considering this game came out in 1992. I would have guessed its release was like 87 or so, but 1992? A year after the Super Nintendo was already out? Yeesh! The soundtrack for this game only consists of about three tracks too. Man, there was like little effort here. As for the gameplay, it feels sluggish and awkward. Despite all the things Spider-Man can do in this game, he still feels slow and limited. I can't even do a basic jump attack, which would have made this game a hell of a lot easier. Also, the way damage and health works is an unnecessary mystery too. Why is it so hard to have a decent HP bar? And why isn't there health power-ups? That makes this game extremely aggravating. In fact, when you die once, it's game over and you only get one continue. That's bullshit because it's really easy to die. And trust me, I died a whole freaking lot. <laughs> 
sometimes it's just way too easy to get completely demolished by a single enemy. You know how aggravating it is to know that you only have two lives to beat this game? And then if you lose, you have to start from the very beginning? Screw that! Every level I played, I had to play it slow just to make sure I didn't risk losing any life. But you know what? You know what the best way to play this game is? To simply not. But those are just my opinions. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, give it a like. If you want to make sure you don't miss out on our future videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button too. I thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Hope the movie's awesome. Take it easy.